If you got your Bible this morning, I invite you to turn with me to Luke, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We're going to look at verse 1 through 10 this morning. I want to share with you a message entitled, The Great Message. The Great Message. As we think about all the messages of Scripture, there is one great message. There is one great theme. There is one great resounding anthem of the grace and the mercy of God, and that is the message of salvation. Amen? The message that God in His grace and His mercy came to live a life that we could not live, die a death that we could not die, and rise victorious over a grave that we could not conquer. This morning we're going to look at a familiar story to many of you. You grew up hearing this story in vacation Bible school and maybe even Sunday school, and that is the story of Zacchaeus encounter with Jesus. How many of you have ever wondered what it, like, what it would be like to have a conversation with Jesus? Well, Jesus has a conversation with Zacchaeus, and so Jesus has a conversation with many people throughout his earthly ministry, and we have the opportunity to kind of dial into those conversations and, and, and imagine, if we will, what it would be like for Jesus to have that conversation with us. And so the more, this morning, as we look at this story in Luke chapter 19, we see the story of the life of Jesus that clearly reveals, listen, it clearly reveals God's desire to embrace people right where they are and to change their lives for eternity. Amen? And that's exactly the message that we need. The great message of Scripture is that God meets us exactly where we are and changes our lives for eternity. Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus reminds us that those often overlooked or ignored by others are the very passion of the heart of God as well as the very purpose of the message of the gospel. I want us to reflect upon the power of this great message today. Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus and, and how this encounter teaches us what God desires for our lives, what it means for God to see us, what it means for God to call us, and what it means for God to to want us within our lives, all right? So this morning, if you will, look in, in Luke chapter 19, and if you will, stand with me as we read the Word of God together today. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. It says, He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, but was unable to because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. And so he ran on ahead and he climbed up in a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and he came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He's gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stopped and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, Half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. Now listen to this. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Let's pray together. Father, today... As we look at this great message, that is one simple story, in amidst the grand story of your word that you've given to us, divinely inspired, imperishable, infallible word. God, let us see the great message, the message that you see us, you call us, because you want us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I think one of the most interesting things to observe in this passage of Scripture is, is kind of a play on words, if you will. Uh, think about it, if you will, as we, as we kind of set the stage for the great message. Zacchaeus. The word Zacchaeus means righteous one or pure one. And as we know in the story, Zacchaeus is a despised one. He's, he's not a very pure man. He's not one that, the, that the, the, the community would like or even wants to embrace because he's kind of an outcast. He's a tax collector. And if you kind of under, don't understand a little bit about tax collecting in, in the ancient world, let me just give you an example of that. Let's just say that uh, Rex here is, is getting his tax collected. He made $100 this week. And so Zacchaeus comes to Rex and he says, Now, the Roman government wants uh, $20 of your $100 for the taxes for, 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 for being a Ro in, in, under the umbrella of the Roman protection. 
And, and so what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to charge you $60 for your taxes. Now, the Roman government wants 20 So how much is Zacchaeus taking home? He's taking home 40 How much is Rex going to take home? He's going to take home 40 You see, because Zacchaeus took 60 of the 100 Rex takes home 40 Zacchaeus takes home 40 And the Roman government gets 20 That's kind of how taxation may have worked in the Roman system. And this is why tax collectors were despised. Why? Zacchaeus didn't work for Rex's money, but he took home just as much as Rex made. Now, Zacchaeus was a Jewish individual, and so he worked on behalf of the Roman government, and so he was not only despised literally because he was Jew by the Romans, but he was also despised by his own people. He was the most marginalized man probably in Jericho. He was the most despised man. He was the one that was kind of pushed off to the periphery of life, if you will. And that was his name, Zacchaeus, righteous one. No one believed he was righteous. No one believed he was pure. He was a man that literally wasn't living up to his name in our lives. I think about that and I think about the church. I think about the ecclesia of God, the sent out ones of God. I wonder, could it be said that we live up to our name? Are we ones who are very passionate about the gospel? Are we ones who are passionate about those who are lost, those who've been pushed to the side of life, much like Zacchaeus, or are we like the crowd in this story? If you read in the previous story, as Jesus was entering on the other side of Jericho, he encounters a man named Bartimaeus who was blind on the road. And if you'll remember, the same crowd that is following Jesus on the other side of Jericho is following him through Jericho. The same crowd that tried to silence Bartimaeus on the other side of Jericho is trying to push out Zacchaeus in Jericho. And yet, Jesus stops in order to encounter Bartimaeus, and Jesus stops under the fig tree in order to encounter Zacchaeus. Jesus is giving a very clear picture to the church, those who are following him, that you can't push people to the side that Jesus has come to seek and to save. Amen? I don't care how you may feel in life. The question is, are you living up to your name? Are you living up to the name of Christ within you? Are you living up to the name that God has given you in life? So as we think about this great message this morning, I think there are three clear, compelling points that we see in the passage of Scripture. The first point is this, he sees me, he sees me. Think about what's going on in the story. As the narrative unfolds, Jesus is coming through Jericho, and there's a great crowd around him, and there's this one man who's very interested in seeing Jesus named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is small in stature, the Bible says, and so he's not able to see because of the crowd. I can imagine Zacchaeus probably trying to politely say, hey, excuse me, let me, let me buy it. And I can imagine some of those people who have been taxed by Zacchaeus for years and years. Can you imagine elbow to the right, elbow to the left? They're pushing him aside. They're marginalizing him. They're getting out to the, to the edges. They don't want to have anything to do with Zacchaeus. They're very focused on who Jesus is. And I, I'm afraid that oftentimes within the life of the church, we can become like the crowd. We can become those who are crowding around Jesus for our own purposes and our own selfish pleasures that we miss the fact that there are people who are trying to see Jesus for who he is that desperately need to see him, like Zacchaeus in life. So Zacchaeus forms his own little plan. Zacchaeus is, a, is an innovative kind of guy, so he looks on ahead and he recognizes Jesus is going that way. I'll get ahead of the crowd. I'll find myself a place where I have the ability to look and observe Jesus, to see him for who he is. And so Zacchaeus runs on ahead, the Bible says, climbs up in a sycamore tree. We all know the little song that goes with it, right? That we all learned in vacation Bible school. It teaches us a very powerful principle that Zacchaeus was that wee little man. And a wee little man was he. Climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he, listen, wanted to see. In other words, Zacchaeus is passionate about seeing Jesus The crowd is passionate about keeping Zacchaeus away from Jesus. Don't ever become one who doesn't live up to your name, following Jesus, pushing people out that Jesus has come to seek and to save in our lives. Zacchaeus is in his tree, and Jesus comes passing by. And the Bible says this, Jesus stopped, looked up in the tree. He sees me. He sees me. You see, the fact of the matter is this, God is willing to look upon your situation in life. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you are. God is willing to look upon your situation. Your situation, just like Zacchaeus, oftentimes means that you are separated from him or that you're distant from others. You're isolated and lonely. I don't care the situation you may find yourself in. He sees you. Amen? He sees you exactly where you are. He sees exactly the situation 
that you're in. The testimony of Scripture, all throughout Scripture, is story after story of God's encounter of people, where they are, His desire to seek them and to call them unto where He is. He sees you. I don't care if you're like Abraham, stuck in the polytheistic land of the Chaldeans, wherever there's a God, everybody's worshiping that God, and God will see you even in that situation. I don't care if you're like Moses, tending your father-in-law's sheep on the backside of the desert. He sees you exactly where you are. I don't care if you're like Daniel, in the midst of the lion's den, where persecution and, and near death is setting upon you. He sees you exactly where you are. I don't care if you're like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for being faithful, being thrown into the fire of adversity. He sees you exactly where you are. I don't care if you're like Peter, who's courageously stepped out onto the water. Now you're neck deep in water because you've got your eyes on everything else except for on Jesus. He sees you exactly where you are. I don't care if you're in an abusive home. I don't care if you're in a neglected situation. I don't care if you're in a depressive situation. He sees you exactly where you are. One of the greatest messages of salvation that's contained all throughout Scripture is this. God sees you exactly where you are. I don't care the situation. You are distant, you're separated, you're isolated, you're lonely. The testimony of Scripture, page after page, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro all the earth looking for someone he may strongly support, someone whose heart is faithful unto him. Zacchaeus is a man who has put himself in a position to see Jesus unbeknownst to him. It was Jesus that was really looking for him. Amen? Think about it. Think about a God who could... Make sure that a tree was planted in a proper place that one day his own son would pass through that knowing O Zacchaeus would go down in history being perched in that tree and have an encounter with Almighty God that day, forever changing his life. Listen, perhaps today you're perched in a position looking on at Jesus. I'm telling you, he's going to pass through. The question is whether or not you'll recognize he sees you. He sees you. Number two, he's calling you. Not only does Jesus stop and, and look at Zacchaeus in the tree, but notice what he does next. He calls to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, don't miss it. Don't run past it. You, you see, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll miss that. We'll, we'll run past it to what, what the, the end result, right? Zacchaeus, come down. Hurry up. Come down. I must go to you. Don't pass. Don't pass. Zacchaeus, think about it. Think about how willing God is to call you from your present situation to his promised provision. And notice whenever he sees you and he calls you. Notice how he calls you. He calls you by name. Zacchaeus. Can you imagine what Zacchaeus must have felt like? No other store, no other person's name is called in the, in the text except for Zacchaeus. There's a crowd of people around. But only Zacchaeus' name is called in this situation. Do you remember it? Do you remember when it happened to you? Do you remember where you were? Or maybe the situation you were sitting in. Whenever the almighty voice of the power of the Spirit of God said, John, he called you by name. Whenever he said, Elda. Whenever he said, uh, whenever he said David. When he said, Catherine. You remember when he called you? How personable God was whenever he said, Allison, whenever he said, Matt, he calls you. He's willing to take you from your position to his provision, and he calls you by name. God knows you personally. Not only does he see you, he's calling you. He not only calls you by name, but the text also says he calls you to his side. Notice what he says, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down. I must, listen to that phrase, I must, I must go to your house. Do you hear the urgency of God in that? Man, there's such great encouragement in that for us, is there not? There's such great encouragement no matter the situation of our house, God wants to come in our house, amen? No matter the situation of destruction that may be in the house, God wants to visit the house. He says, I'm calling you right to me. I'm calling you to be my guest. I'm calling you to walk with me. He calls you by name. He calls you to his side. But not only that, he calls you to complete 
transformation. Complete transformation. We see it in the text. Look at what, what is happening. Uh, he passes by, calls him, he calls him to his side. And, and then notice what happens in verse 7. There's a little bit of an aside, is there not? And when they saw it, who's they? The crowd. The crowd of people that had tried to push Zacchaeus out. The same crowd of people on the other side of Jericho that had tried to kind of push Bartimaeus away and shut Bartimaeus up as well. That same group of people, they saw what was happening. They saw that Zacchaeus, the one who had uh, extorted them for years and years, the, the most despised man probably in Jericho, Jesus now is calling him personally by name and inviting himself to come to Zacchaeus' house. Can you imagine all the people in the crowd that would have loved for Jesus to come to their house that day? I mean, there's a, probably a multitude of people that were thinking, why don't Jesus, why don't you just come to my house? And yet the most despised man in the passage, in the text, in the city, is the very man that Jesus calls by name, the only man he calls by name, and the only man he chooses. He says, I must, I must go to your house. Hey, here they are. They see this. Look at what happens. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Far be it from God to go be the guest of a sinner. Amen. Here's a man that has come to seek and to save, verse 10 would say. Seek and to save that which is lost. And this is where you hear the urgency in, in Christ's voice. I must, I must go to your house. Not only do I see you where you are and call you to where I'm at, I, I must be a part of this. Whatever you do, don't find yourself in the crowd that despises the people that Jesus is calling. Don't ever find yourself in a crowd of, uh, uh, of onlookers or churchgoers who, who begin to, to turn your nose up to those people that God has actually put in front of you for the very purpose of the fact that He is seeking to save them because they are lost, and that's His mission. And that's your mission in life. He sees me. He's calling me. He calls me by name. He calls me to his side. He calls me to transformation. Notice what happens in the story. Zacchaeus, who is a rich man, the Bible says, in one fell swoop, in one confession of repentance, in one turn away from what he was to, to what it was that God wanted for him, in one swoop he goes from being a rich man to a poor man. Look at what he says. He says, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone, I'll pay back four times what I've defrauded them. Let me tell you, this was a restitution that was according to Mosaic law. If you look back in the Mosaic law, if you've, if you've been found to defraud someone, you pay them back four times what you owe them. So what is he saying? He's saying half of what I got, I'll give away to the poor. And the rest, I will give back four times. You know what he's done? He's literally bankrupt himself economically. He becomes a rich man physically that was poor spiritually. He becomes now a rich man spiritually that is poor physically within his life. Total transformation, radical shift. Zacchaeus now is a righteous one. He's living up to his name. He's a pure one. He's one who has repented. Notice what this confession, this repentance, notice what it does to Jesus. Today, hear me, today salvation has come to this house today you see the heart of transformation is a heart of repentance he sees me he's calling me don't forget the number three he sees me he called me he wants me he wants me have you ever thought about that have you ever thought about the fact that god wants you he wants you you know what's in your heart. You know the wicked thoughts that go through your mind. You know the despised things that maybe you've partaken in in life. You know the messed up person that you really are. Guess what? God does too. And he still wants you. He wants you. What a great glorious message. Not only does he see you, not only does he call you, but the fact of the matter is he sees you and he calls you because he wants you. He wants to radically change your direction. He wants to radically change your ambitions for life. 
This is exactly what it is that biblical salvation, the grace and the mercy of God does. It takes a man from darkness to light. It takes a man from chaos to calmness. It takes a man from sadness to joy. It takes a man from, from, uh, from obscurity to, to, uh, to the, the power of God within their lives. This is what salvation does. He wants me. He wants to take up residence within our lives. He wants to transform us from the inside out. He wants to use us as vessels of honor for glorifying His name among the nations. Think about those things that God wants to do. He wants to take up residence in you. He wants to radically clean the house. He wants to transform the house. He wants to change you from the inside out. But then, He wants to use you. We don't have much about Zacchaeus beyond this. But I can imagine when we get to heaven, there's going to be a celebration. And old Zacchaeus, little short fellow, is going to be running around there somewhere. He's going to have stories to tell. I once was a man stuck in a sycamore tree. He saw me. He called me. He came to my, my, my house because he wanted me. And this is what he's done through me. Can you imagine that? Oftentimes, those who live in obscurity are the ones that God uses profoundly within life. Why? Because he wants to use us as vessels of honor. Let's look at verse 10. Hear it again. For the Son of Man. Hear it. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I believe this is Jesus speaking. I believe he stops in the midst of this situation. He looks around at the crowd. As they're trying to process all that has taken place. They've watched Zacchaeus, who they've tried to push out. Now been in the very special honored guest of Jesus himself. Jesus to make a bold pronouncement. Salvation has come to this house. They've watched all of this to unfold. The same crowd that tried to push Bartimaeus out, the same crowd that tried to push Zacchaeus out, Jesus stops and he looks at them and he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. There is a great message for the lost in this statement. There is also a great message for the saved in this statement. Here's the message for the lost. Have you ever personally experienced the reality that God sees you right where you are? He's calling you by name from where you are to where you need to be with Him. And He's doing it just because He wants you to experience His grace and His mercy in Jesus Christ. That's the message for those who are lost. Have you ever personally experienced the reality that God sees you, God wants or is calling you, and He wants you? Today, if you're sitting here and you've never truly come to understand the fact that God sees you no matter where you are, He's calling you from where you are to where you're supposed to be with Him because He wants to radically change your life by His grace and His mercy. Please hear me. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't wait tomorrow. Don't wait till this afternoon. Make that decision today. You can step out of your sycamore tree unto the eternity, the abundant life that God has called you to. There's also a message for the saved in this statement. Shouldn't it be our driving passion in our lives as followers of Christ to do exactly what Jesus' driving passion was? The answer to that is yes, it should. If the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost, what do you think He's charged us with? Seeking and saving. Not that we do the work of salvation, the Holy Spirit does that, but we share the gospel message that leads unto salvation. The Bible says in the book of Romans, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can they hear unless someone is sent? How can they, or with us as a preacher, how can there be a preacher unless someone's sent? You see, the message of the gospel is to be proclaimed. If this is the driving passion of Jesus, it should be the driving passion of us, shouldn't it? Uh, should this not be the identifying mark of his church? Shouldn't it be the identifying mark of every gathering of believers, every church that is gathered under the authority of the name of Christ for the proclamation of the name of Christ unto the nations? Shouldn't it be that the identifying mark is that we are people who seek after the lost within our lives as churches? Yes, it should. Let me give you two very 
pop cultural statements, but I think they're true. The church that doesn't evangelize, hear me, the church that doesn't evangelize will eventually fossilize. You hear me? The church that doesn't evangelize will eventually fossilize. You'll become nothing but a relic of what you used to be. Something for someone to look at and say, well, this is what it was, but it's no longer that. It's now a fossil. Hear me again. Let me make it a little bit more personal. The believer, the believer who doesn't evangelize will eventually fossilize. You say, well, pastor, that's pretty straightforward. Well, listen, Jesus said it like this. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, what is it good for except to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of man? The believer who doesn't evangelize will eventually fossilize. There is a great message in this statement, both for the lost and for the saved. If you are a person that you know deep down in your life, deep down in your heart, you have never come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there is a great message. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He sees you. He's calling you because he wants you. And he's calling you by name. Don't miss the fact that Jesus is passing by today. If you don't know for certain that you're a believer, today is the day of salvation. There's a great message for the saved. If this is the very passion of Jesus, should it not be the driving passion of his people? The church or the believer that doesn't seek to save the lost will eventually fossilize. Let's pray together. As we come to this time of invitation, two ways. Number one, if you're here today and you don't know for certain that you're a believer, you're saved, you are set on the course for eternity. God has radically transformed you by His grace and His mercy. He's looked up into your tree. He's called you by name. You have gladly, hurriedly come down to receive Him and to let Him transform your life. My, my friend, listen to me. Today is the day. Whenever we stand in just a moment, I want you to step out from where you are and to come to me. I want to share with you how you can know for certain by simply repenting of your sins and embracing the life, death, and resurrection of Christ in exchange for your life. The Bible says you will be born again, born from above. For the believer today, during this time of invitation, maybe you should examine your own heart and ask if the very passion of Jesus to seek and to save the lost is the very driving passion of your life today. A church that doesn't evangelize will eventually fossilize. The believer individually who doesn't evangelize will eventually fossilize and become worthless, good for nothing. Father, this is your invitation. I pray, God, you would use it however you want to do it, to do whatever you want to do. As we stand before you today, O oh God, I pray that you would move our hearts. Lord, if there are those that are here today that do not know you, they've never come to know you, they've never publicly uh, confessed you, they've never publicly put their life out and saying we've repented of our sins and I've, I've embraced Christ in my life. God, I pray that you would call them. Your word says that unless the Spirit draws, a man's not coming. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would draw by the power of your Spirit those who are lost in darkness that may be sitting here today that need to come to the glorious light of Jesus. For those who are saved in this room today, I pray you would convict their hearts to understand the identifying driving passion of your people are those who've been pushed aside, pushed to the edges of life, marginalized, the lost. That's your passion, and it should be ours as well. Give us a passion for the gospel among the nations. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.